all of us at CNBC TV 18 and our viewers would give anything to spend half an hour with Warren Buffett, for sure. But uh, since uh, not many of us will have the good fortune to be with Warren Buffett, I'm going to give you the next best thing. To be half an hour with someone who follows the principles of Buffett and who has spent quality time with Warren Buffett, I have with me Monish Pabrai. Well, Monish has a lot of uh, qualifications. He's a businessman. Uh, he started his first business, uh, Transtech, That's with $30,000 $30, from his uh, 401k and a little bit of loan. And he sold it 10 years later for $20 million. From 2000, that is when he sold his business. He has been an investor and he has a record beating 1100% return on investments since 2000 so you are you know you are with someone who is pretty much close to Warren Buffett well uh, Monisha uh, you also paid six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to have one lunch with Warren Buffett that of course was a charity lunch uh, uh, let me start over there how was that uh, that one hour or two hours you spent with the big man well first of all uh, pleasure to be with you Thank pleasure you. to be on CNBC and uh, wonderful to be in this setting particularly. Um, well, the, uh, the lunch with Warren Buffett, you know, I felt like I had uh, ripped off all the man's intellectual property and I had made all this money and uh, I wanted to thank him. And uh, there was an opportunity because he was uh, doing these annual lunch auctions. So I tried about three times and got outbid. Okay. And then finally in 2007 we prevailed and uh, then in 2008 we won, in, uh, won the lunch and really the, uh, the objective I had was to simply be able to look him in the eye and thank him for his generosity. Okay. And, uh, and of course what ended up happening is that uh, Warren in all his lunches that he does every year, he has an objective and his objective is to make sure that at the end of the lunch the winner mm. feels they got a bargain. Okay. And uh, I do believe we got the bargain of the century. Uh, so, so Warren. So it's a conversation where he genuinely tries to give you what he has learned. In fact, he he sat down. I'd I'd gone with my wife and my daughters, and the first thing he said to us is, "I've got nothing going on all afternoon. Oh. So until you tell me to leave, I'm here." Okay. And uh, and he said, "You can ask me anything." And and what he would do is when we'd ask him some innocuous question, he convert it into a learning opportunity and it was learning with humor okay. uh, it was a comedy show you know and uh, you know I started addressing him as Mr. Buffett Mr. Buffett this Mr. Buffett that and both my daughters were sitting next to him so he told them you know if you call me Warren maybe the grown-ups will learn too <laughs> okay. for us in India now and maybe for investors all over the world it's a time of great disquiet. I mean, everything that we believed in is falling apart. Brexit was the first shock, so globalization ain't working in the perhaps most liberal of countries. And then the Trump victory, uh, which makes a person in emerging markets feel that perhaps U.S. will grow, but without including or at the expense of emerging markets. Do you think that will happen? Uh, no, I think we have to distinguish between uh, candidate Trump and President-elect Trump and finally President Trump. Okay. And uh, I think that uh, we, we have a, a wheeler dealer who's, uh, who's in the White House and um, he, he does like to make sure that uh, the deals are winning deals. Now they, he'll, he'll focus on the deals being winning deals for the U.S. Yes. But they are, in my opinion, going to be winning deals for the world. Okay. Uh, and so, so you have to distinguish between the rhetoric mm. and reality. So, for example, Trump uh, has made a lot of comments about NAFTA, mm. about erecting, you know, trade ba trade barriers and such. That's not going to happen. Okay. And uh, the people he's appointed are pro business, mm -hmm. pro growth, and uh, pro pro globalization. Okay. And uh, and so they are going to be pushing that agenda. Okay. For whatever reason, the FIs are big investors in India. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this negative trade, negative EM, short EM trade, is a bit of a worry. You think uh, uh, India should worry about it? No. 
I mean, I think that uh, the, the foreign institutional investors, if they are dancing in and out of the Indian markets based on these factors, uh, then quite frankly, they the will hurt, they're going to hurt themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think that the thing is that, the, in fact, India is a, a tremendous market uh, with, you know, plenty of businesses which have very phenomenal growth prospects. And right now, uh, compared to six months ago, many of them are on sale. So that is, uh, unless you were someone who is only going to be selling equities and never buying them, you were close to retirement and such, uh, you should rejoice. You know, Absolutely. hamburgers are on sale, so that's great. <laughs> okay. No, well, on sale is fine, but okay, uh, I know you don't take too much interest in short term issues, but how would you uh, view the demonetization that we just went through? I mean, for want of a better word, we should have called it currency change. Uh, is that something that is short term and noise? Or will it have longer term, slightly medium term ramifications? No, I think I think demonetization is a huge shock. It's a shock to the system, Absolutely. and I think there's no question that uh, that will impact GDP growth in India for uh, more than a quarter or two. It will it will have a negative impact because you're trying to uh, kind of recalibrate the economy. Exactly. But I do believe that when we look back five years or ten years from now it will be a great positive. Okay. And so uh, there is near-term pain. Uh, there might have been, you know, it's, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, if you will, <laughs> in American football lingo, <laughs> yes. that we can look back and say, well, could the government have done this or could have done, done that? And so, yeah, surely, surely there are ways they could have executed it that may have made it uh, a little bit easier for the common man. But uh, they're also dealing with a very intractable problem, Absolutely. multiple intractable problems. And so, um, so I, I actually, you know, in the last couple of days in India, I, I asked, uh, you know, various uh, people I'd run into, and I don't see a kind of an animosity. Okay. Uh, even when I talk to people uh, on the street, uh, they, they seem to have uh, a kind of a pride that the government is actually going after uh, some, some bad actors. So, so I think Modi has a reservoir of goodwill. And uh, he, he might be drawing on it, mm. but he still has a reservoir. Okay. And uh, so I think that it will, it will work out fine. Uh, you know, the thing is that humans, humans are very adaptable. And I would say Indians probably more adaptable than most humans, you know, the concept of Jugaad, if yes, you will. Yes. So, you know, the, the thing is that, uh, like I was asking my, uh, my staff before I came to India, hey, you know, what am I going to do without money and this mm -hmm. and that? So they told me, look, the Golgappa Wala takes Paytm now. So they, they told me download the app, and I did. So in the U.S., I got myself set up at Paytm. Okay. And so now I'm, I'm all set, you know. Okay. No problem having Golgappas. You know, the Jugaad has also <laughs> had its negative... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's behavior, right. That's right. The, the, the black money holders exactly. are, are running one step ahead. So what you accumulated black money in 10 years, we have managed to launder in... Probably uh, you know, five uh, weeks. Right. So the Jugaad is also working negatively. But, but I think us. that even even people who succeed in bucking the system, they pay a huge price. Yes. So no matter what you do, the conversions, as I understand, the conversion is a 30 to 50 percent haircut. Yes. So the bottom line is, I think that long term, it's not going to change behavior for everyone, but it will change behavior for a certain maybe minority of those people who will think twice and say, maybe I ought to play within the system. One of the difficulties you have with black money is when you play outside the system, it limits a lot of things. Exactly. You, know, you know, where can you invest? How can you invest? Uh, what can you do with the assets? You know, many times the assets are misused. Uh, if you put it in gold, my personal opinion, one of the worst asset classes you can go into. Uh, so, so, so basically, you have negatives that come out by uh, not playing within the system. So you hope that the shock might yes. make some people think uh, it's more profitable to uh, actually pay taxes because... Yeah, I think, I think playing within the system. Uh, and the second thing is that, you know, uh, there was a U.S. president who had said that if, if he had the power mm -hmm. to behead a dozen people every year for no reason, mm -hmm. it would make ruling really easy. Okay. So the thing is that we need, we need quote-unquote public hangings. So what, that, what I mean by that is prominent people have to go to jail. Yes. And, and if we can get even a dozen or two mm -hmm. of prominent, well-known people being sent into prison, 
that will change behavior like nothing else will. Okay. And so I am hoping because now all the IT sleuths are out there. Yes. So uh, I, I don't know what the Indian laws are about jail time and such, but it has to go beyond fines. It has to go beyond penalties. And I think they, the government did tell them, right, after the last deadline. Yes, yes. Yeah, so if, if we can get to prison time, we are going to see very rapid change. And, uh, and in fact, the same thing happened in South Korea. Uh, in the 1980s, South Korea was an extremely corrupt country, uh, through and through. And today, corruption is more the exception than the rule. I mean, you just saw that the, the premier got removed. Absolutely. Uh, it went through a transformation. And I have no doubt that India, when we look back in 2025 or 2030, it will look different. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm. This may be that transformational shock. Uh, uh, yeah, and I don't think it's enough. I mean, I think that you know, just the demonetization is not enough. But, but I think uh, my sense is Modi has got a few more trump cards. Okay. Forget, uh, my, <laughs> pardon my pun. Okay. He's got a few more trump cards up his sleeve. Okay. Oh well. Uh, uh, we need to concentrate on uh, the spot where we are standing and maybe the camera should, uh, you know, look at uh, the board over here which says uh, IIT JEE coaching. Uh, that's provided by the Dakshina Foundation. Uh, it's important to note what uh, Munish uh, and the Pabrai Foundation are trying to do in India. Uh, they are trying to alleviate poverty through education. Uh, tell us about it, Monish. Uh, uh, I mean, why did you hit upon this way of giving back to your country? Well, I would say that, you know, uh, clearly Warren Buffett's been a huge influence in my life. And the best things I learned from Warren Buffett have nothing to do with investing. Okay. Uh, and they have everything to do with living a great life. And one of the things that Warren uh, enlightened me on when I read his writings, probably maybe around 12 years ago, was that large inheritances are a burden on your next generation. In fact, uh, it, they do more harm than good. So, uh, so Warren basically highlighted that, um, you know, he has a quote, he says, I want my kids to get enough money for them to do anything they want, but not enough money for them to do nothing, oh. right? So okay. I always try to figure out what is that number. Uh -huh. um, but the thing is, so uh, my wife and I, uh, we were on a trajectory, thanks to Warren, where we would probably end up with more assets mm -hmm. than we could consume. Okay. And so then the only choice, if you're not going to give it to your gene pool, mm -hmm. is yeah. to give it to society. And so if you're going to give it to society, again, at Warren, as an investor, we want high social return on investment. Absolutely. And uh, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Yes. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Okay. And so we are in the business of creating fishermen. Okay. And we're not in the business of giving food to people outside temples. And so this is a place, in fact, I tell the kids this, I tell them, you are fishermen, uh, you're being trained to be fishermen, you're going to be particular kinds of fishermen, but that's the whole idea, is to uh, do a transformation. And, and the, the ROI is really off the charts. You know, we spend uh, over two years approximately one and a half lakh per child. Okay. And the average income that these kids are coming from is less than eight or ten thousand rupees a month. Okay. That's the kind of demographic they're coming from. They're going to start with salaries over ten lakhs. In two months out of a fifty, sixty year career, in the first two months of their earning, they've earned back what the whole program costs them.